morning again. Good morning. Good morning. What an amazing song. I don't know about you, but I, I, those words kind of cut right to the heart of the, you know, right to the heart, if you will, the true heart of worship. Uh, for me, it, uh, every time I hear it, it touches to the very core of my being. I don't know, the words, uh, the, the, the music, the way that it's sung, just really, uh, really hit home in terms of, uh, of how God wants us to worship Him. Uh, and, and, the, and the song, the words, I mean, it, it's, they're, they're so true. Uh, they move, they're moving. And for me personally, and I hope for everyone that knows Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, they're humbling. They really, uh, they really put things into proper perspective. And if you didn't know, it's, it's a worship song uh, written by worship leader Matt Redman. And it was released in 1998, so it's been around a while. Uh, and he wrote it. It's interesting. I read a little bit of the background on the story. Uh, he wrote it because of his deep concern for the direction that his pastor sensed that the, the worship in his home church uh, in Watford, England was going. And there was a certain dynamic, something, there was just something that was missing in the worship. Uh, that their pastor, Mike uh, Pavacki, wanted to address. He, he wasn't quite sure, but he, he, he knew there was something that was out of sync. So he, re he reminded his church family that they were designed to, and this is a quote of his, be the producers in worship. Are you hearing that? He reminded his, you know, his, his folks, his people, that we are to be the we are to be the producers in worship and not just the consumers. And he asked his people. This is the question he asked him. He says, and this is, I guess, a question we're asking. We should hopefully ask each of our each of ourselves as we come in on Sunday. When you come through the doors on Sunday, what are you bringing as your offering to God? Now I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands. I'm not going to ask for anyone to stand up at this point. But you all answer, ask that question to yourselves every week, right? What am I going to bring to God as an offering for Him? And Redmond wrote the song, The Heart of Worship, to describe what took place as he saw God's Spirit move in the hearts of the people of His church. It's been recorded by several artists. You may know, you know, I know Michael W. Smith did a really nice uh, rendition of it. And, and over the years, it's actually become an international anthem, if you will, uh, for the church worldwide. And it's interesting because Redmond says that he viewed the words, words simply as his personal subjective response to what he was learning about worship through that process. That's all it was. That's all that song is. It was just his own personal reflection of how he saw God's Spirit working in the worship of the people in the church that he was attending. That's all he was trying to do. <coughs> Obviously, it looks to me like God had a bigger purpose in that song. And uh, in my opinion, the song describes in detail what takes place in the heart of believers <coughs> when, we, when we grasp the true essence of the worship of God and we put him in his proper place. In other words, it's the signs that when everything else is stripped away, and that is so hard for us to do as human beings, I'm sure every one of us has carried something in with them this morning that is causing their worship to short circuit. I go so far as to say there was stuff happening during the worship. Because Satan doesn't want us to worship God the way he wants us to worship him. <coughs> he loves it when the focus is on us. He cherishes those moments. Those are victories for him. He's, he, you can almost hear him applauding. Like the song says, when everything else and that covers a whole list of things. Everything. Just think of that. 
I kind of like get the impression that that we're in this, you know, have you ever seen those little bubble things? People get inside them and they're rolling up and upside down and all. You know, you can't touch them. You're, everything is, they're in these little bubbles. It's almost like we get this impression that, you know, when everything is stripped away, but it goes deeper because we get to that point when we realize who we are and we realize who God is, what happens to us in true worship is when our sin breaks our own heart because we know it breaks God's heart. It's those, those moments when we think, you know, what, what we think we deserve disappears. Or the things that we want disappear. When we become aware that telling God how worship should be carried out is wrong. Have you ever tried to do that? Have you ever tried to tell God how he should be worshipped? I know we all try to. See, when everything is stripped away and all that, we begin to understand that worship is all about one thing and one thing only. And you know I'm not going to sing it to you. But I'm going to say it. It's all about you. It's all about Jesus. Amen. That's what it's all about. Now, Pastor Francis Chan, if you're familiar with him, he warns us believers. This is an interesting statement. Listen to what he says. He says, as believer, he warns us as believers, he says, by catering our worship to the worshipers. Are you getting what he's saying? By catering our worship to the worshipers, which I guess is us, and not the object of our worship, he says, I fear we have created human-centered churches. And I have to say a resounding amen to that. And I fear sometimes that when we come together to worship, there is the possibility that we might not get it. That we are missing the very heart of worship. And recently, my heart has been even more burdened for you, you know, for us as our as your pastor, especially in light of what Jesus told us in John chapter four. Remember when he spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well? Remember we covered that a few weeks ago. Listen to what Jesus says. He's talking to her, and Jesus in verse twenty-one, John chapter four, the gospel. He says, Jesus declared. He says, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. He says, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. And he says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth because Jesus himself says, for they are the kind of worshiper the worshipers that the Father is seeking. That's who God is looking for. And then he says in verse 24, God is spirit and we're in his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. See, God has designed us as human beings to be worshipers. Now you may know that, you know that, you may not have known that. But God designed us to be worshipers. And Chan describes it like this. He says, human beings by their very nature are worshipers. Worship is not, is not something we do. It defines who we are. And he goes on, he says, you cannot divide human beings into those who worship and over here and those who do not worship over here. He says, everybody worships. But he closes this statement by saying it's just a matter of what or when or whom we serve or worship. And I'm going to suggest it could be God. It could be our intellect. How much we know. It could be... We can, guys, we talked a little bit about this this morning. and so We can worship our Bible knowledge. 
obviously, our house, our car, maybe our favorite sports team. How about those Patriots? <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> But the point is, every, every, you know, every one of us worships something or some things. And the Bible tells us that we were created by God primar primarily for one purpose, and that's to glorify God. Listen to what Isaiah says in Isaiah 43, 7. Isaiah writes, it's God speaking, but Isaiah writing, in verse 7, and he says, Everyone who is called by my name whom I created for my glory, for my worship, if you will, whom I formed and made. So that, if you're ever wondering, if you're ever sitting down at the breakfast table and you're wondering, why was I even created? Why did God make me? There's your answer. Every single one of us was created by God to worship him. He designed, he de designed us to worship him above everything and everybody else. There's nothing more important than worshiping God. And I believe that God's Spirit has been speaking to me and encouraging me to make sure that we as a body of believers. that we worship God and that we do it in the way that he deserves, the way that he commands to us in the way that we should. Because I fear that if we do not do that, if we don't have that mindset when we come together on Sunday morning to worship God, I'm going to go for so far as to say we're wasting our time. And I'm going to take it a step further. I think we can actually become an offense to God. How many would like to be an offense to God? Nobody, of course not. I know that. Because I know there's nobody here that wants that to happen. I don't want it to happen. So what we're going to do this morning our desire is for us to make sure that we understand the heart of worship. And that with the hope that we will commit or recommit if necessary to worshiping God His way. So that He will be glorified in every minute of our worship here at the Church of the Way. And to encourage us to do that, we're going we're gonna to look at the only psalm. There's 150 psalms. I don't know if you knew that. But we're going to look at the only psalm out of 150 psalms that are in the Bible that is called a psalm of praise. And I didn't know that. I'm thinking, what? There's a lot of psalms, 150 of them. That's, this is the only one that is called a psalm of praise. And if you didn't know, it's Psalm 145. We're going to look at what worship is. We're going to look at who and what we should worship. We're going to look at why we worship. And we're going to look at when and how do we worship. Now there was a concern on somebody, one of our, one of our folks' parts this morning, that can, was concerned for me. And they felt a deep desire to make sure that we prayed for me. Very interesting. And I have to admit, and I, I, I said to the individual, well, we'll do that another time. But as I've been thinking, I'm thinking, you know, maybe God's saying something. Maybe we better pray for me. Gary, would you come on up? Raj, could you come on down? Alan, you up front? Apparently <coughs> On guard. RT, come on up, please. That's okay, Raj. Thank you. I just don't want to take things for granted and uh, assume I know more than God. So I'm going to ask you guys to lay hands on me, and uh, Gary, I'm going to ask you to pray for me. Would you do that, please? Hey. Father God, I just praise you now. 
And I thank you, God, for what you're doing for this church through our pastor, John, Lord God. He's a good man. He's a holy man. You have made him righteous before you, Lord God, through his belief, through his acceptance. And Lord God, he has turned his back on the things of the past, and he marches forward, Lord God. He listens. He wants to hear from you. He wants to do and guide this church as you, Lord God. Just brings him forth, Lord God, as you, Holy Spirit, works through him, Father God, through your words, through your words in the Bible, through your words from somebody in the congregation, Lord God, that you prompted to, to pass the word to Pastor John that he needed to have prayer too. And Lord God, this whole church needs prayer, but right now I lift up our pastor to you. Lord God, I praise you. I would ask that you would just anoint him in the name of Jesus. And I praise you, Father God, for what you're doing right now in this place, this day, with our pastor and with our people that are here, Lord God, to praise you, to worship you, Lord God, as you would have us to worship you, Father God. You are holy. You are righteous. You are all living. You are everything, Lord God. And Lord, I just pray that each and every one of us and our pastor would always put you first in all things. And I thank you, Lord God. I praise you, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, my brothers. Thank you. <laughs> Let's turn to one of our, uh, Psalm 145 if you haven't already done so. And let me just, uh, let me just read that. And it says, it's the NIV, a psalm of praise, and it's uh, written by David. And he starts off, he says, I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise, his greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and they will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of the power of your awesome works and I will proclaim your great deeds. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all, and he has compassion on all he has made. All you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your, your saints will extol you. They will tell of your glory, of the glory of your kingdom, and speak of your might, so that all men may know your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful to all his promises, and he's loving to all he has made. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all who look to you, the eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every little thing, living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving to all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries and he saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. And David closes in verse 21 when he says, My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. And he says, Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Amen. Wow. Yeah, we're done. <laughs> I'm kidding. But wow, isn't that what an amazing guy David was? So the question, what is worship? What is worship? So in a technical sense, it's not here necessarily in the text here, so don't be looking for it. In a, in a technical sense, it's a term, according to the Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary, that refers to the act or action associated with attributing honor, reverence, or worth to that which is considered to be divine by religious adherence. And you got all that, didn't you? Let me do it again. 
Worship refers to the act or action associated with attributing honor, reverence, or worth to that which is considered to be divine by religious adherence. Again, more of a general. But for Christians, for believers, for those of us that know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, worship is often defined as the ascription of worth or honor to the triune God. In other words, we give praise to God. We worship God. We put Him in His rightful place in our lives all the time. And if you can picture it, it's kind of like an inter interrelation between divine action, you know, God at work, if you will, and human response, our response, to that action. And, you know, we've talked a lot about it. My, my, my heart's beating. And by the looks of it, all yours are as well. I'm not making it beat. I'm not telling it to beat, but yeah, it's beating. Because it's God's action, His activity in my life. I'm sucking in air just like every one of you guys are. It's just the way He has designed it. It's His actions, and we respond to it. That's what worship is. In other words, God acts like God, and we respond accordingly to that action. That kind of makes it kind of simple, doesn't it? God acts as God. He does the things that God does. And we as human beings, His creation, we respond to how God acts. <clears throat> For the worshiper, that's us, it's a response of, of adoration. And I like that word. It's so much different to like something versus adoring something, isn't it? Maybe I like a lot of things. <laughs> I like this, this pew here. I don't adore it. So it's adoration. It, it, it's, it's deeper than just having a, a, a sense of, oh, you know, I like God. It's a response of adoration, humility, again, realizing who we are and who He is, submitting our desires, the things we want, our will, if you will, and ultimately to obedience to God. That's how, we, that's how we respond to the things that God does. And if you think about it, and you know Scripture, you know that started way back at the very beginning with Adam and Eve. And it continues throughout all of eternity in the book of Revelation. So we see the worship, worship of God from start, and I'm not going to use the word finish. There isn't a finish in terms of worshiping God. It just goes on and on and on. And as we said earlier, we can, of course we can worship things and objects, you know, we like idols and, and other gods and other people, which, you know, we do on occasion. So the question is, or what it, is it that we should worship? And, and David tells us for right off the start, verse 1, he says, I will exalt you. And he identifies who you is. My God, the King. In other words, David is telling us that our worship goes to God. We worship God, the maker of heaven, the maker of earth. And God made it crystal clear when he gave Moses his law way back in Exodus. The first four commandments outline exactly. God identifies himself in several different ways. He says, I am the one you are to worship. Listen to what he, he tells Moses. as he gives them the commandments. And God spoke all these words. Right, off, right from the start, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Slavery, You shall have no other gods before me. 
In other words, you don't, don't worship anything or anybody else. And he goes on and he says, and oh, by the way, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. He says, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, he says, the Lord your God, I am, an, I am a jealous God. And he goes on to explain, here's what's going to happen if you punishing the children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, in other words, those who don't worship him, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Uh, so you're kind of getting what God is trying, I mean, he's pretty much prioritized. Worshiping him makes a big difference. And then he goes on, he says, and you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. And then he says, and we're going to, just so you don't forget, he says, we're going to set aside a special day for you to do that. In verse 8 he says, remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. And he goes on, he says, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath. And who is that to? It's to the Lord your God, to me. And he says, on it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter or your manservant or your maidservant, nor your animals or your, nor the alien within your gates. He says, for six days the Lord did made heaven and the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And David kind of says amen to that as we flip over to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. David writes here, he says, verse 23, Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and joy in his dwelling place. Are you, are, you, are you getting the picture that David is painting of God here? I don't know anybody else like that. So he says in verse 28, he says, Ascribe to the Lord, O family of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. And then he says, Bring an offering and come before him, Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. What an amazing picture. And Paul kind of kind of <coughs> illustrated the same thinking in Acts where he confirms what David and what God was saying through Moses he confirms this truth to the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers in Athens after he had left Berea. Listen to what he says in Acts chapter 17. And what was happening here, so you understand, the Athenians had tried to cover every base. They had a god for everything. And they were just lined up one right after another. The god of the pews, the god of the speakers, the, the god of the microphones, the god of the clock. I mean, there was a God for everything that they could think of. However, there was one stall, if you will, one place that was marked for the unknown God. So listen to what Paul writes, uh, Acts 17, verses 22 through 28. And he's, you know, interacting with the, with these, uh, you know, these uh, philosophers and Epicureans. In verse 22, he says, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus, and he said, Men of Athens, he says, I see that in every way you are very religious. For I have walked around and I've looked carefully at your objects of worship. I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. 
And he says, now what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. And here he goes, verse 24. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by humans. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. Doesn't that take, to me, as I read that, that takes so much of a weight off of our shoulders when we come in on Sunday morning to worship, we don't have to do all that stuff. God's got it covered. He makes it, so all we need to do is simply worship Him. That's it. And he goes on, and he says, From one man he made every nation of men, verse 26, and, they, that, and that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined that the, the time set for them in the exact places where they should live. And he says, God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he's not really, you know, he's not very far from each one of us. And then he says to them, he says, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. That's who we worship as Christians. So then the next question that comes to mind is, why, why should we or why do we worship this one God? And David tells us in Psalm 145, verse 1 again, he says, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Again, we worship God because He's what? He's the King. We've even got it up here. Right over here. Look, there it is. He's, he's not only the King, He's the King of Kings. In other words, He's over every King. And just to make sure we get it, He's also the Lord of Lords. There's nobody over Him. John MacArthur writes, he says, in relation to this psalm here, David, he says, penned this most exquisite conclusion to his 75, 75 psalms in the Psalter. So obviously David wrote 75. And he says, here's, here's what he did. He, he here the king of Israel, which is David, extols and celebrates the king of eternity for who he is, for what he has done, and for what he has promised. And this is King David. And David goes on, he says, we worship him before, because he is king, in verse 1. We worship him because he's great, in verse 3. He does mighty acts, in verse 4. We worship him because of the glorious splendor of your majesty, in verse 5. We worship God because of his power, in verse 6. We worship Him because of His abundant goodness and His righteousness in verse 7. We worship Him because of His grace and His compassion in verse 8. We worship Him because of the glory of your kingdom, His kingdom, and His might in verse 11. And we can go right through this entire psalm and go on and on and on. We worship him because he is the only one that demonstrates king, the kingly qualities of God as the perfect ruler. There wasn't, there's nobody else that can do that. David for sure didn't do it. Solomon tried. He didn't do it. And we could name every king in history. Not one of them, not one other king demonstrates the kingly qualities of God as the perfect ruler. 
verse 3 says, Great is the Lord, which focuses on his uniqueness and, his, and then also his, the greatness that no one can fathom. And as I, thought, as I read that, that passage, that, that, that little phrase, I'm thinking, well, what? And what that says, when, when David says his greatness no one can fathom, what David is doing there is he's confirming that God's greatness is immeasurable. So what David is saying here is, pick a number. Pick a, there isn't one. There's not a number that we can pick that can measure the greatness of God. And as I, re as I realized that, and I sat there and I thought, and I'm thinking, that's amazing, because we hear, you know, with deficits of trillions of dollars and zeros, you know, going from here to the other side of the room, and, and I'm thinking, you know, that's a lot. That's a lot of numbers. But what David is saying here, by the greatness of his goodness, nobody can, we can't pick it, there's no number that can describe his greatness. So it would seem to me that to worship him, it's a no-brainer. Because there, no, nothing, nobody else, nothing else comes, comes even close. Even when Gary was praying for me, I'm thinking, when he said, you know, he talked in terms of righteousness, and, and right away my mind came, no, 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 no. But then he clarified. Because see, whatever righteousness I have, whatever righteousness we have, it comes from God. It's not mine. Ask Bonnie. See, we worship him because of who he is and because of what he's done and what he has promised. Listen to what the Apostle John says in Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And this is just the seven angels coming with the seven plagues. But look what John writes. He says, I saw in heaven, which is quite an amazing thing to try to visualize to anybody. But anyway, he says, I saw in heaven another great marvelous sign. Seven angels with the seven left plagues. Last, because with them God's wrath is completed. It's finished, it's done, it's over. But look what he says in verse 2, And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast in his image and over the number of his name. Yeah, what a picture. They held harps given them by God, and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the Lamb. And here's what they said. Here's what they were singing. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? Because what they were singing, they said, For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you for your righteous acts have been revealed. <laughs> you know what I say to that? I, I say hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay, now let's get to the nitty gritty of worship. <coughs> when and how do we worship? I keep going back to verses, the first couple of verses, but here we are again, verse 1 and 2. I will exalt you, my God, the King, which we covered already. But look what he said. I will praise your name forever and ever, and every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. So he says, I will praise your name, and he says, every day I will praise you, and then I will extol your name forever and ever. So it seems like David is saying, there is never a time we, we do not worship God. I'm kind of getting the impression that God wants us, He expects us to worship Him 24-7, 365 days a week. A year, I'm sorry. Thanks for catching that, by the way. 
Listen to what David says over in verse uh, 1 and 2 of Psalm 146. He says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. He says, I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. In other words, to that very moment when I'm breathing my last breath, I'm praising and worshiping God. Wow. But yet at the same time, he did set up specific days that were to be set aside to worship him collectively as a unified body. Remember we read that in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 20, verse the beginning of verse 8. The Sabbath. And he tells us in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, he says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. He says, let us not give up what? Meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another as, uh, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So God is telling us we need, we, he wants us to set aside a specific time to worship him. And it was determined to worship him on the first day of the week, Sunday, to commemorate his resurrection. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, I know he's talking about you know, the offering, the collection, but in essence he's giving us guidance here as to when the church was to meet. He says now in verse 1, 1 Corinthians 16, now about the collection of, for God's people, he says, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, which is Sunday, the Lord's Day, if you will, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. And then Luke writes in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, he says, and on the first day of the week, he says, we came together to break bread. And so by doing that, God instructs us as to how we are to worship him. When we worship him on that day, we worship him with our entire being. With our bodies, with our hearts, with our spirits. There are 168 hours in the week. I don't know if you knew that. 168 hours. And guess what? Every one of us gets 168 hours. Did you know that? Nobody gets shorted. Nobody gets more. 168 hours. That's it. And God tells us that when we worship him at that specific time, that day, if you will, we set aside that time, and remember for the Jewish folks it was the Sabbath. For us as believers, it's on the first day of the week that we set aside that time so with our focus on just that very thing, God and worshiping Him. I look at it as like God is saying to us, uh, I want you to give that little bit of time on Sunday morning, and I want you to give, you, give me every minute of it. So I'm kind of thinking, God is, I think he's telling us how he wants us to worship him. And I think he wants us to prepare. So to me that means before we come to church, maybe it's a good idea to take time and prepare ourselves to worship him and leave everything else back home. Listen to David again. Before we worship, we prepare our hearts and our spirits, and he tells us that by meditating on your wonderful works, Psalm 145.5, if you want to get excited about, for, by, you know, about God before you come in on Sunday morning, just reflect on what he did for you already the, the, today, or yesterday, or last night, or last week, and get excited about what he's done for you. So when you come through those doors and they're closed, you just bust them wide open. Because you can't wait to get here. 
to worship him with the rest of us. I'm thinking it might, and just a suggestion, it might be a good idea for us to get on our hands and our knees and ask God's Spirit to reveal any and every sin in our lives that would prevent us from being able to worship Him in spirit. Because as we mentioned before, Satan loves to do that. And when we get here that our thoughts and our conversation should be about one thing, and that's Him. And the hope would be that as we sit around, uh, you know, together in the fellowship hall, around our tables, uh, interacting, and, and that, that we're focusing our conversations on the good thing that God has done for us this past week. So that we can rejoice with Him. And thank Him. And pray. The hope would be that when we come to worship, that we will, as God himself instructs us, that we would be still so that we can know that he's God. And our minds aren't racing five, 500 miles. I'm so glad we have the five-minute warning. Because when I see that, I know it's time to <coughs> settle down. To settle down. Because God tells us in Psalm 46, 10, he says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. So I'm kind of thinking, I guess that means we don't talk to our neighbor. We don't talk to the person a few rows over and stuff. And we haven't seen him all week and want to say, That's not the time. You have 166 and a half hours to do that. It's a lot of time, 166 and a half hours. Because this is God's time. That's how God wants us to worship Him. And Chan writes this interesting, it's, it stuck out to my mind as when I read it. God gave us His order for the church. He told us what he wanted through his commandments in the Bible. In our arrogance, Chan writes, we created something we think works better. Interesting. But I, I like him because he counters that statement with this. He says, and I want you to I'll let this sink in, please, because that's, that's what we're here for. There's nothing better than being absolutely sure that the most powerful being in the universe adores you as his own child. And he uses that word adore. Man, let that sink in. The God that we're here to worship, he adores us as his own children. Moms, you know exactly what he's talking about here. And I'm sure dads do too. We know what it's like to adore our children. God does that for us. We have an awesome and amazing God. He created us to worship Him the way He instructed us in His Word. Worship is giving honor and praise to something, someone, or something. We believers worship God. That's the who we worship. Because He is God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's why we worship Him. And we worship Him every day. And we will worship Him forever and ever. And we worship Him on the day that belongs to Him. And we, when we worship him, we worship him with our entire being. Let me read Romans 12, 1 and 2 again. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. He says this is your spiritual act of worship. 
There it is. It couldn't be any more plain. So Paul says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. And I'm going to add, and worship him the way that he wants to be worshipped. I want you to know, and I, and I think you do, but I want to say it again. I love each and every one of you. I care about you. I, I hope that you sense that in my heart as I share with you. But even better than that, God loves you too. And he does a better, much better job than I do. And we want all of us to be able to worship God the way that he wants us to worship him. My prayer, our prayer has been for this week is that, is that when we come to church on Sunday morning, that we entertain this thought. Rather than thinking of what we would enjoy or asking others what they would like, we ask the simple question, what would please God most? Put that inside, if you have a Bible, put that in the inside cover. If you want to write on top, that's up to you. I'd, I'd probably do it on the inside. But so that when you carry it and you open it, and you're getting ready to worship God, you ask the question to yourself, what will please God most this morning? Let's get to the heart of worship together. I believe that if we do that, I believe it will transform every single one of us. It will transform this church. And God has been doing some amazing things here. But I believe he wants to do so much more through us and in us. He has big plans for what he wants to do at the Church of the Way if we allow him to do it. And he does it through those who worship at the very heart, at the very core of worship. And if, you, if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to make that step or take that step, if you haven't been or if you are, and you're, you just want to tell God, God, I want to get to the heart of worship with my life. Every minute of every day, and especially on Sunday, I want you to stand right now. <clears throat> Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God bless each and every one of you. Don't sit down. I want to pray for you. Can I do that? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the love that you have for us, for the way that you speak to us through your word, through your spirit. God, thank you for making it possible for us to worship you. And not only have you made it possible for us to worship you, you tell us when, how, who. You even empower us with your spirit so that we can connect with you. Thank you for your son, Jesus. And I pray for each and every person that's standing in this room this morning. Help them to understand that they're not making this commitment to me. They're making it to you. I am making it to you. Father, I pray that you would continue or to increase us as a church with regards to our worship for you. I pray, God, that each and every one of us would embrace 
the very core, the very heart of worship. I pray, God, that as we come together, as we close our service, that, God, that you would just plant in our hearts a desire like that we've never had before, one that just burns and does not get satisfied until we come back together next Sunday and worship you. I pray that you would transform our worship service. I pray that we would give you your rightful place in our hearts, in our lives, and in your church. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.